Over the past few days, we have been around the area of Verdun, exploring the, the battlefields of really one of the most titanic struggles of the Great War. And anytime I go to, uh, you know, a battlefield or someplace like that, I'm always wanting to go to a museum because in addition to, you know, going to historic places, I also like to see historic things and artifacts. And I'm guessing that the Verdun Memorial, which has a museum inside it, is going to have a bunch of cool stuff. Plus, the sun is shining, and I hate the sun. Uh, so we're going to get inside and uh, see what there is to see and learn inside the Verdun Memorial. We just stepped into the museum here and uh, were greeted by this uniform of a French soldier, which seems kind of an odd setup for war, but the way that men are going to enter this war is going to be completely different than the way they leave. And they also have some maps here that give us an idea of how things progressed around Verdun. So right here, right here, you can see where in September of 1914, the lines kind of form a salient around the city of Verdun. Okay, now moving on, this is picking up kind of like midway through the war, so we're in 1915, uh, and then it continues on showing the progression of the lines around Verdun. Uh, so here you can see where the attack is going to occur north of the city, and uh, right here it moves on to 1918. Uh, showing the, the push of the lines like when the, the Americans arrive. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on into the main part of the museum now. Okay, we just made our way into the, the main part of the museum here, and there, I can already tell a bunch of things to see. Uh, we're obviously not going to be able to hit it all, but uh, anyway, we're going to kind of make our way through here, show some of the artifacts, and uh, yeah, see so, so what we can uh, piece together to learn a little bit more about the Battle of Verdun. When we talk about World War I, one of the things that really kind of makes it a world war is that a lot of European countries, like the uh, you know, the French and the British and the Germans all have colonies abroad. So what we're looking at here is a map of some of the, the German and French colonies. And uh, they would be calling in troops from these colonies to come to Europe and fight. So for the French, you have men from Senegal and from Algeria. Uh, so yeah, this, this was a... Uh, definitely a, a multicultural army that is fighting here in Europe. Here we have some examples of some German headgear uh, from World War I. So you see the steel helmet up there at the top of the Stahlhelm. And then uh, down here at the bottom, well, this is the headgear that the Germans are going to enter the war with, the Pickelhaub. So this is made of pressed leather and uh, a lot of people think that it's metal, but, but it's not. Uh, but these were to protect the soldiers from glancing blows from cavalry sabers. And uh, this one right here is the artillery version of the, the pickle hob. Yeah, very interesting. Of course, we all know that in World War I, we're gonna see the introduction of all kinds of new terrible weapons. Um, you know, so here we're looking at some 77 millimeter shells. Uh, one of the weapons that would have been deployed with these would be gas. Uh, so here we see on display a German gas mask. Here is the canister that it would have been held in. And then here's one that is an experimental design. And I've actually never seen one like this before. You can see 
got that uh, kind of a Prussian spike up there, kind of a pickle hob looking uh, amalgamation here. Uh, and then they also have, again, this is a reproduction of another weapon that was going to be introduced in World War I, uh, and that is the flamethrower. Well, right here is probably the most iconic artillery piece of for the French uh, during World War I. This is the French 75, and uh, this was uh, really a, a good anti-personnel uh, piece of artillery. Not so good for busting trenches and bunkers and, and things like that, but it, it was on this rec had this recoil mechanism in it that allowed it to fire uh, without being repositioned, which meant. Uh, this one's a little bit different here, but that meant that, um, you know, you could fire on target like up to 15 rounds per minute. Uh, that could potentially overheat the barrel. So typically the rate of fire in the field for these was about three to four rounds per minute. But yeah, the French loved this thing. In a prior episode, we talked about the, the sacred way into Verdun. This was a supply route that really kept this city afloat during the Battle of Verdun. Uh, so the, the the lines went around Verdun, basic, basically uh, leading to it being surrounded on three sides. Well, you have to have oh, a route in to bring in troops. You have to have a route in to bring in supplies. And what we're looking at here are a couple of vehicles that uh, represent what would have been used on the Sacred Way. So this one here uh, would have been used to haul gravel, uh, to keep the roads from turning into just a, a, a big old muddy mess. And then here we have another one that would have been used to supply troops. Uh, so anyway, it, it's called the Sacred Way for good reason because the success of Verdun depended on it. Here are some interesting pieces here. Uh, this is a military record book for a French soldier. I'm going to get it in focus here. By the name, uh, had the last name Constantine, uh, Charles Constantine. Um, and then the ID discs for French soldiers in World War I are a little bit different than what Americans might be used to. We're used to, you know, dog tags that, you know, would hang around your neck. Uh, the French had like an ID wrist bracelet. Uh, so here's one for a French soldier by the name of Ferdinand Noel. And uh, you can see it has his date of birth on there. And then this is the ID disc that the German soldiers would have had. And then this is a military record book for, again, a German soldier who fought uh, here at Verdun. Yeah, interesting. We were talking helmets a little bit earlier. Let's take a look at a few more pretty interesting examples. Uh, so again here we have the German Stahlhelm or the steel helmet. Uh, this soldier has modified his a little bit though. Uh, put this barbed wire around it that way you could put twigs or branches or things like that inside. Uh, and then later well, soldiers started doing uh, other things. They started painting their helmets to try and blend in with the surroundings. Uh, they also developed helmet covers to kind of uh, cover it up and keep the sun from shining and reflecting off of it and giving away your position. Uh, now this one is just weird as heck to me and I've never seen one like this. Uh, this is a helmet. You can see the little small eye slits right there uh, that was basically developed for snipers. And I, I don't think it saw very wide circulation. But if you look, you'll notice there's a notch that's cut out right here. Uh, well, that is so the soldier can shoulder his weapon. And then uh, a few more examples, or one more rather. Uh, again, here we have the Stahlhelm. Uh, but this one in particular has a, uh, a steel brow plate on the front. So this is so that sentries 
could have a little bit of extra protection and then also getting a little bit medieval here we have this uh, steel breastplate that sentries could use as we see in this picture right here if you are a french soldier in world war one well you're also serving as a bit of a pack mule as well this is the kit that a french soldier would be carrying on their back uh, so you can see their blanket roll they've got their knapsack there some hobnail boots canteens uh, ammo belt yeah this uh, it just imagine hauling this stuff on your back through through the mud uh, you know much less over you know flat level ground um, and then over here well this is the uh, German variant of the same thing yeah pretty interesting to see this when you're talking about the Battle of Verdun or really any battle of the Great War for that matter uh, the the primary killer is going to be artillery so this display here is talking about the role that artillery played in the Battle of Verdun uh, the, the men who fought here now there are areas that you really wanted to avoid if at all possible hilltops especially uh, also supply routes were, were heavily hit uh, also water collection points and when these artillery rounds would go off well, they explode and they send out all kinds of bits of shell fragments and shrapnel that will just absolutely mangle human flesh. I mean, look at this. Imagine being hit by one of these shell fragments. Um, I mean, this one right here would literally cut a man in half. And... Um, yeah, our artillery just just maimed men in all kinds of horrible ways. Uh, some of the, the smaller rounds uh, would uh, scatter, you know, shell fragments over a distance of 30 to 40 meters, whereas the larger ones could send shell fragments for a couple of kilometers. Here's an interesting piece. Uh, of course, when you think World War I, there's a lot of trench warfare, very nasty places to be, and uh, being in low areas have a tendency to fill up with water. Now, this is a pump that they would use to try and rid the trenches of standing water. They have a few World War I rifles in here for us to take a look at, which is always appreciated. Got a Mosin Nagant up there at the top and uh, a few Mausers. Here's what I really wanted to focus in on though. This is a periscopic rifle butt that of course uh, would be used in the trenches. So you would mount your rifle up here and then this apparatus would allow you to uh, aim it over the trench and fire it without exposing yourself. Yeah, pretty interesting. We talked quite a bit about the artillery in the Battle of Verdun and that opening barrage by the Germans. Well, one of the things that really helped to make the artillery successful and really so one-sided in the Battle of Verdun 
uh, was air power. Uh, so in addition to the fact that the Germans had heavy artillery and the French didn't have anything to answer for it, uh, the Germans also had a massive concentration of air power at Verdun. I think they had like 280 planes here. And uh, as the, the battle commenced, uh, they shot down, I think, like 70 French aircraft and a bunch of observation balloons and uh, just essentially rendered the French artillery blind. Uh, here you can see a Maxim machine gun that was used in one of the German aircraft. Um, and then they also, you know, bombed targets, uh, you know, behind the lines. And there was also an anti-personnel weapon that they had called flechettes. Uh, these are darts that would be thrown out like a hundred at a time and by the time they hit terminal velocity these things could puncture right through a helmet or the skull of some French poilu. Yeah, pretty wicked. Yeah, but there they have a few uh, propellers from both French and German planes uh, right here in the museum. Pretty interesting. Now, here's something that is quite near and dear to my heart, and that is trench art. Uh, I, I find this stuff just to be so fascinating. Uh, so here are some walking canes uh, that were developed by soldiers. And then as we look at these, I do want to point out that with trench art, you kind of have to be careful. Not all of it was made by soldiers in the trenches. Uh, even during World War I, uh, civilians were picking up pieces off the battlefield and making really some, some neat art pieces out of them. And then uh, they would sell them and it was seen as kind of a patriotic thing. Uh, so you can see different things here that are made out of bullets and shell casings. Um, here's one that's really interesting. You have a crucifix that's been made out of some shrapnel and then probably the most common that you see are these uh, shell casings that have different scenes or designs etched in them but yeah I, I always enjoy seeing uh, seeing the trench art Well, that was uh, pretty dang cool. I, I know I say this a lot, but I, I didn't even show a fraction of what they have to see inside that museum. Uh, there was just so much to see and so much to learn. You could literally spend half a day there. Uh, plus, there, were, there was a bunch of people there today, too, and I didn't want to be obnoxious and, and disturb their experience. But anyway, uh, if you're ever in Verdun, definitely make the Verdun Memorial uh, one of your stops. Again, much to, to see and learn there.